Welcome to the podcast, Let the Prophet Speak. Today we are studying Hosea, chapter 13. That's Hosea, Perak Yud Gimel. And this is Saul Weiner, the host for your podcast. In the last chapter, 12, we pretty much had a, stor- a historical review where God discussed the sacrifices that our forefathers made in their relationship with God and how God gave us, the people of Israel, the guidance that we needed, but instead the people strayed from him and um, did not appreciate what he had given them. With that, we begin today's chapter, which is also a chapter of significant rebuke uh, with a little bit of consolation mixed in. The Verse 1 is one of the most challenging verses in this chapter to interpret and to uh, translate. But let's begin. Kidaber Ephraim Rises. I'm first going to translate this verse the way I'm going to, the, the way I feel is the, it reads the smoothest and the easiest. And then I'm going to mention some of the other ways to explain this. The, the, the difficulty in interpreting this pasuk, this verse, hinges around the meaning of the word resace or retate. The reason is because this is the only place that it appears in a Hebrew verse in the entire Torah, in the entire Tanakh. Even though in Aramaic and in later Aramaic writings, the word resace is a retate, resh taf taf, is an extremely common word. And in Aramaic, it means to, um, to shake from fear or awe. Uh, trembling from awe or just awe and or fear in general. So the assumption is that this word means here the same thing it means in Aramaic. And then the difficulty becomes, once you make that assumption, how you translate the rest of the verse. So I'm going to say as follows. Kidaber Ephraim Rises. When Ephraim spoke, remember Ephraim is the main tribe of the ten northern tribes. Ephraim is the tribe which, from which the leadership broke off the the from the southern kingdom and made its own northern kingdom. The Jeroboam or Yeravam ben Avot was from Ephraim. So Ephraim were the, was, were the leaders of the revolt, so to speak, the leaders that led the civil war. And, and when the leader speaks, there is trembling and fear. In other words, the leader had the power. Kedaber Ephraim says, when Ephraim spoke, there was shaking and trembling and fear. Nosahu be Israel. He, Ephraim, was great in Israel. Israel meaning again the northern kingdom. He was the great leader. He was the one that led the whole revolt. And what did he do with that power of leadership? By Yesham Babal, by Amos. And he led them straight in the direction of idol worship, straight to the Baal. And he ended up dying or causing death. That's the way I translated this verse. I just want to mention <clears throat> that <clears throat> some, including the Malbim, assume that this fear is referring to the fear that Ephraim, the leadership, had. Kidaber Ephraim, when Ephraim spoke of fear, they, were, they had the fear that the people were going to not follow his, his, um, his, uh, his leadership and they were going to go and follow along, go back to the southern kingdom and go back to worshiping God. So they therefore set up uh, a new um, uh, idol worshipping uh, of, the, of the Baal. That's one way of understanding it. Rashi says that the Kitaber Ephraim Rises is read as one phrase, meaning when Ephraim spoke of fear and, and trembling and fighting, Ephraim started up the fighting with the southern kingdom. Radak learns that it was the fear that when that once that Ephraim refers to the entire Israel saying that it used to be in previous times before the people of Israel sinned that the nations of the world trembled in fear Kedaber Ephraim Rises but now they just became like everyone else a bunch of idol worshippers those are three other potential readings of this Pasuk um, I gave you mine based on uh, what I think grammatically makes the most sense and what flows the easiest, but um, obviously there's many other ways to understand it. Let's move on to verse 2. The um, Atta and now, they led them in the direction of the Baal, of the of thing, and now Yosifu Lachato, they continue to add to their sins. Vayasu Lohem Masecha, and they made for themselves a, a, um, an object of worship, an image. Mikaspam 
from their silver they made it kitunam atabim like in their um in their way they have skilled workers who can make uh, images and 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 carvings maase something created by carpenters and, and carvers and sculptors kulo lohem heim omrim these are all for them they say um, in other words uh, everything they do is all from the people that created them um, and zovche adam agolim yishakon all of those leaders they, they all, all they say is this if this our our lives everything that we have is because of them because of these images that's how base the worship of idols had become so adam agolim yishakon those who the Adam could literally mean those who sacrifice human beings, which is an awful practice that we are unfortunately aware did happen with some of these idols. Or it could mean those people who bring sacrifices, they are just giving um, kisses to, to, to animals, to, uh, to calves, as if, as if the calf, which is the, the idol was in the form of a calf, as if that's some kind of a god that they should perform in, in, in a loving way, uh, worship them. Um, I just want to point out that obviously there are many, many, many issues with idol worship, uh, including obviously the most fundamental theological problems with it. But the emphasis that the Prophet constantly makes here in this book and in, and in most of other, the rest of the books of Tanakh is that idols are made out of our own valuables. So when we worship idols, we are worshiping our own money. And I want to make sure that, that you understand that this is one of the main issues of corruption when it comes to idol worship. The second is that the, the idols are the work of our own hands. So the worship of the idols is the worship of what we do as if it's something that we did ourselves out of our own power. Again, these are two reasons why idol worship is such a serious issue. Um, God continues and says, Lachain, therefore, as human beings, because the issue of idol worship is the issue of worshiping ourselves and our own power and our own strength and our own money, God says, no, you guys are like nothing. You'll be like the fogs of the morning that just dissipate throughout the day. And like the dew, the moisture on the ground, which just dries up right away. Like the chaff that just blows out of the granary. The shells of the grain that just light and just blows away in the wind. And like smoke coming from a, from a fire that just floats away. Because... You, when you worship idols, you're seem to, you think you're worshiping yourselves. You think you're worshiping your money, your power. That's nothing. Only I, God says in verse 4, I have been your God from the beginning, from the time we left Egypt. You have never known another God. There is no one else who can save you besides me. No one else can help you besides me. In verse 5, I looked after you when you were in the desert in a land of thirst, in a land of hunger, when you needed help. And I was the only one that was there. God is reminding us of His permanence and His devotion at the same time as our, our nothingness and our um, uh, temporariness. Kimar um, isam verse says in verse 6. When you, when you grazed, when the people grazed, and when the people ate and they became satisfied, so of who they became satisfied, God says, because I satisfied you, because I was your shepherd, Mar Isam, I was the one who shepherded you and gave you that food, but then the people became haughty, they became arrogant, and that's why you forgot me, God says. Again, it's the arrogance, the belief in our own power, in our own self, and in our own abilities, and in our own wealth, and, and the worship of that wealth and arrogance that ends up ruining us and taking us away from God. And therefore God says, I am going to punish you. I am going to be a source of suffering like a lion. A shochal is a, a term for a lion or a leopard that is standing and pouncing on the way to Assyria when you're going to go off into slavery with Assyria. I will meet them, I will greet them with the anger of a mother bear who is losing 
who, if someone tries to harm her calves, will protect them with a vengeance. The ekras segor libam, and I will tear open the um, their closed hearts. This, as we see later in this chapter, as we see later in this chapter, there is slight, slight hints of consolation here in these harsh words. I will open their hearts here. I'm interpreting as meaning I will bring them back to repentance by tearing apart the things that is covering their hearts from returning back to me, God says. And I will eat them there like a young lion, and the beasts of the field shall hurt them and harm them. Uh, again, this is refer the reference to the countries that will take them into exile. In this particular case of the Northern Kingdom, that would be Assyria. Yisrael kivibi Ezracha. You have destroyed yourselves, Israel, because it was in me that you had help. But you didn't turn to me. You turned to yourselves. You turned to your own arrogance. Ehi malkacha efo. Now, where is your king? If you recall, in the time <laughs> when the people of Israel wanted a king, God didn't want them to have a king. He knew that kings could lead to corruption, to accumulation of wealth, to accumulation of power, to, to empire building. These are the things that God didn't want us to do. This was the way of the nations. This was not our way. Our way was to be with God. Now, where is this king? Where is this king? Where did he lead you? The king that you look to to save you from your enemies. Um, uh, where are all these people who are going to come save you in your cities, Vishovtecha, and your judges, Asher Amarto, that you said, Tenoli Melech Vesorim? You wanted to get a king. You wanted to get officers. You wanted to build a nation like everyone else. What happened to them? Where are they? They can't even save you now. Only I am able to save you. Eten Lecha Melech Ba'api. I'll give you a king in my anger, meaning I'll give you a king from another nation who is going to cause you suffering rather than redemption. And saving, and rather than saving you from your enemies, he will be your enemy. And then I will take them away in my anger. This is verse 12. Um, I, um, there's, there's a lot of explanations of this tzorur. Tzorur is like a bundle or something that's tied. I'm going to initially read it the way Rashi reads it. It reads smoothly, meaning, Tzorur of Onofrayim, I have held their sin quietly with me this entire time. Tzifunachataso, his sin has been hidden. In other words, I haven't made you suffer all the way until now because I've held it. I've held it close. I've held it tight. I've given you time to learn your lesson and change. You just didn't do that. And let me just mention another way of reading this is... Um, is such as how the Evan Ezra reads it. It is Tzorur of Onofrayim. It is bound with me and I will never forget it. Um, the, the, the issue, I, I'm choosing Rashi's translation because first of all, it doesn't seem to be true that God says he'll never for, forget it. He, not that he won't, he will forgive. He will allow for repentance. Um, and also it flows here, Tzorur of Onofrayim, talking about, we've been talking historically, this, in, this chapter and the last one, this entire time they've accumulated the, the wealth, the, the riches, the so on, the, the land, and so why now? But either, obviously those are two explanations, there are others. I, I chose to translate it the way I just did. Chavle Yolei Dov This is verse 13. Pangs of childbirth are coming to him. Um, um, I just want to compare for a moment to another place where where the sufferings in the that are that are being foretold by the prophets are compared to childbirth, um, and this particular suffering of the childbirth that leads to to no no result, no children, in other words, no positive result, that that's like the worst kind of suffering. At least the suffering of childbirth has, in ordinary, proper circumstances, has a very happy ending. But when there is no happy ending, it's, it's, it makes the suffering so, so much worse. I'm, I'm going to look at Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 26, that's chapter Chafvav, verse 17 and 18, um, 
where Yeshayahu said, Harinu Chalnu, we have become pregnant, we have God had labor pains, Kemoyaladnu Ruach, but it is like we have given birth to, to wind. In other words, we've given birth to nothing when people are talking about their suffering. Kimo, in the verse 17, I just read verse 18, and backing to verse 17 in Isaiah 26, Kimo Horo Takriv Loledes, the suffering is like a pregnant woman who's getting close. This is how we have suffered from your punishments, God. So again, that's, um, that's, this is a comparison that Hosea makes that Isaiah also made, like I just read to you. There are other places where this comparison is made. But here let's read what Hosea says in verse 13. The birth pangs will come to him, meaning Ephraim, coming, meaning the northern kingdom. And he is a son who is lo chacham. Literally that means who is not wise. The, the Mepharshim explain lo chacham to mean is not healthy, will not survive, which is like the most intense kind of suffering that you could come and imagine ki es lo yamod bimishpar bonim for in time he will not stand he will not make it through that the birth stool the mishpar the place where the birth takes place he will not make it through because the suffering will be so bad and the result will be so depressing now this next verse is, is a verse can be read and I think should be read as a verse of consolation um so, and I'm going to read it that way, and then I'll discuss it a little bit. Miad Sha'ol Efteim, from the depth of Sha'ol, uh, depths of hell, I will redeem them. In other words, yes, I will take them all the way down to the depths, but I will Efteim, redeem them. Mimaves from death, Egolem, I will redeem, I will, uh, um, uh, Egolim also, I'm going to use the word redeem. I'm I, looking for a better English word. I will um, save them. Ehi uh, divorecha maves. Where are your words, death? In other words, death, you cannot take them over because where are you? I, God, am stronger than that. Ehi katov chashol. Katov is a word, it's difficult to translate, but it means uh, some horror, some terror, some some fear. Ehi, where is your katov Where is your terrible uh, fear or plague? O Sheol, O Hell, because I am much more powerful than that, God says. Nocham Yisaser Me'enai. This translation of this word, Nocham, um, I'm going to translate for a moment, and again, I'll discuss it. Uh, nocham Yisaser Me'enai. The Nocham meaning here, revenge, I am going to hide from my eyes. I will not go all the way and, and punish all the way it will end there will be an end to it as we see in this word noham could mean that we see in genesis 27 that's beratius chaf zion um pasuk uh, 42 pasuk uh, verse um um mem Bez, where rivka was talking to her son yaakov rebecca was talking to her son jacob and telling him to run away because asav was chasing after him to kill him. What were the words she used? She says, He is, he is, he is telling himself that changing his mind from love to hate and because he wants to come kill you, the word nocham there means revenge. So that when God is saying again the same thing over here, um, uh, um, I not, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to read it again. Uh, this revenge is hidden from my eyes, making this Pasuk consistent. Now the other way to interpret this Pasuk is that it continues along with, with the theme of the rest of the chapter, which is mostly uh, rebuke, mostly um, uh, criticism. Um, and then they would say that nocham isaser means nocham from the language of ki nochem Hashem al that God will be consoled. He will change his mind from evil to good. He will, he will forgive. So nocham isaser may not God be saying forgiveness is taken away from my eyes. In other words, he's not going to forgive anymore. Now, first of all, I don't like this simply because it's just an awful thought. So I'd like to go to something a lot more pleasant than the thought that forgiveness can't be found. And also because it's not consistent with the rest of the Pasuk. The way those Mepharshim 
need to read the Pasuk if they interpret Nocham that way. Nocham meaning God will not console, God will not forgive. They have to read the rest of the Pasuk as in past tense. That I have done that. I have redeemed them from the depths of hell. I have redeemed them from death. I, and so on. And, and they still rebelled against me and therefore I will not forgive. I think that this is referring to the future, which is exactly what the words are. It's the F dem, Aleph, Fe, Dalet, Mem, which means I will redeem them. I will save them. So, and then the, so I do think that this is, and it's, even though it's not, it is consistent with the rest of the chapter because prophets do that all the time. They talk about the destruction, but they also say that despite the fact that the destruction is something that's being dis- prophesized, but there will not be total destruction. God will save in the end. And now let's turn to the last verse. Kihu bain achim yafri. This is again another place. The word achim usually means brothers, but it also means, as we know from the story of the um, cows of Paro, vatir eno ba'achu, which is the same word meaning a marsh, that they were standing in the marsh, in the reeds. So, because he bain achim yafri, which is the way Rashi describes it, and is the way I'm going to choose now, and again I'll have a little bit of a discussion about the meaning of the verse. Um, because he... Among the, the, the marshes, Yafri, he is grown. In other words, I allowed him to grow in a marsh, which is wild, something that grows bountifully and plentifully on its own. And he, he flourished. Ephraim, the northern kingdom, the people flourished. However, because of his choice, Yavo Kadim Ruach Adonai, there will come an easterly wind, the wind of God, Mimidbar Oleo, come up from the desert, the hot wind, Vievosh Mikoro, it will dry him out from the roots. This is again because we were talking about a marsh that's so moist at the bottom, saying, but I'm going to come and dry him out from the bottom. Vayecharav Mayano, and the spring which feeds the marsh and keeps it moist is going to be destroyed. Hu Yishse Otsar Kol Klichemda. He will, um, um, he, meaning the wind, the one that comes, referring presumably to Assyria, will destroy all of the treasures, all of the beautiful items that the people have. It will be destroyed. Now, the next verse, which is listed as the first verse of chapter 14, is really the end of Hosea 13, but the Christian counting puts it as verse 1 of 14. Unlike every other time in this podcast where I've chosen to follow the Jewish um, ways of making the chapters, in this case I'm going to stick with the Christian numbers and do the, that first verse as the beginning of chapter 14. And the reason is simply because it is a it has a very, very uh, horrible ending of destruction and I'd rather not end with that kind of utter destruction even though we're still ending on a sad note but not quite as sad as the next verse so i'd rather start off the next chapter 14 um, with that verse and chapter 14 we will have one of the most well-known and one of the most um uh popular and one of the most comforting chapters of hosea and one which many of you will be familiar with and hopefully I, uh, you will be looking forward to uh, that next chapter. Thank you so much for joining me for chapter 13. Looking forward to studying chapter 14 and completing the book of Hosea with you.